Good morning. Welcome to our morning cafe. Today is much needed. <laughs> For some reason, uh, I woke up this morning and I'm still trying to wake up and it's been a, a crazy, crazy day. <laughs> it just began. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 I've not found that in my life. Uh, what did really? you not go to bed on time? Or, yeah. We, hey, we did, but uh, it was a busy Sunday. Um, we did that the mass in the morning, the the radio mass, and then uh, we did a, a Spanish mass, and then uh, we did a prayer at four, and then we were setting up for adoration uh, at night. And it was such a beautiful night. Speaking of that, it was. I don't know, I was really moved by it, like people responding, people coming to, um, to that beautiful sacrament, and, uh, and, and not only the sacrament of, of reconciliation, but adoring the Lord in the parking lot. You're, yeah, you're talking about the parking lot adoration last yeah. night from 8 to yeah. 9, and confessions in the Life Teen House. So by the time we were done, um, it was a long day. Beautiful, long day. So maybe that's why today I'm having a hard time uh, trying, to, trying to wake up. Well, I think if anybody watched, uh, uh, was assisting at Holy Mass this morning, that the celebrant who shall remain nameless had a few moments of, uh, of, of seeming pause. <laughs> I could only chalk that up to, to, uh, to Monday morning. So for those of you who uh, wondered what some of those pauses were, those were just, those were just uh, uh, maybe just a few senior moments in the... <laughs> In the in the early morning, so I apologize for any of you that uh, think what's going on. <laughs> hey, it's uh, it happens. It's Monday. That's why today uh, the coffee is much needed uh, to fuel us up uh, and the Holy Spirit as well. Yeah, it's um, right. So we're we just got done with the octave of Easter, right? The, 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 yes, la last week we were just talking about. How like the church invites us to celebrate Easter, the resurrection of our Lord, like for eight days, as if it was a single, or the, as if it was the same day, and so as we concluded yesterday is uh, Divine Mercy Sunday with uh, as the last day of the octave of Easter. So we're technically done with that octave of Easter, and if you notice, if you join us for evening prayer, uh, the psalmody that we were praying. Uh, including the antiphons was always the same because of this reason that we were in the octave of Easter and it was the same Psalms and it was the same uh, um, antiphons for the day the reading was always different and then the antiphon for the the um, I'm having a senior moment yeah, yeah. <laughs> junior moment there we go. Yeah. Uh, Everything after the psalmody was usually specific to the day, but, but some asked why was the psalmody the same? Why did you keep repeating the same psalmody, the psalms, for both morning and evening prayer? Well, as you joined us for evening prayer. And that's the reason that during the octave, um, it's, it's a one continuous um, uh, a continuum. And so the liturgy, particularly the liturgy of the hours, the divine office reflects that. So from now on, you'll notice a, a change, a different, it'll be different every day as we, as we pray uh, with you. So now that the octave is done, what, should I just uh, go to the beach, enjoy the, the life, the day? Are we done with Easter? That's our prayer, that we're not, and uh, that was certainly the, the goal this morning as we prayed Holy Mass at 645, is that there's this sometimes this sense of a of a big exhale, a big letdown uh, that we we move through the octave and the octave is intense, and then we get to Divine Mercy Sunday and all that's entailed with that. And and um, at least in this morning's homily, we likened it to a ship, a sailing ship, where the sails are filled with wind and the the ship is on course and it's making it's uh, it's making a, uh, it's making a good good way forward uh, with with full wind in the sails and then all of a sudden we run the risk in these remaining days of Easter of just beginning to maybe get a little complacent uh, letting the sails luff a little bit and we kind of bob and and weave and and maybe enter into the doldrums and 
that's absolutely what we can't do. We have to we have to stay very much um, uh, on course and and try to keep our our spiritual sails uh, filled with wind and moving forward. Um, and that's I think even the way that our scriptures talked about today that was talking about a holy boldness that was that was almost even more intense uh, in the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, and that's going to be our, our theme as we go forward. No letting down, no drooping, no, no, no weaving and bobbing, uh, trying to find the wind. So what we're doing is we're building to the Ascension and, and to Pentecost. So the, the Gospel readings for the Sundays of, of, of Easter, that sense of recalling and remembering Christ, but building up the communities. The first reading will come from Acts of the Apostles. Guide us and direct us. How they went out in the world, we got to get ready to do that again. Uh, you know, come Ascension and then come Pentecost. Absolutely. So the Easter was just like the, the warming up of the mortars, right? To get ready for so what's coming. It's a celebration of a great event. Absolutely. And now the beauty of looking up to um, not just the resurrection, because the Lord was not just done at the resurrection, right? Now we're looking as the faithful as His body on earth, looking forward to the Ascension of that beautiful day when our Lord ascended into heaven and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. And not only that, but from there, like He sends us the power of the Holy Spirit upon us so that we can be strengthened, bold, and, and we truly become alive with a sense of, not just a, a sense of, I'm good and I'm alive and I feel good and it's all good and beautiful, but with a sense of responsibility that comes with going out and building the kingdom of earth, His kingdom here on earth, through our humble uh, surrendering to God and by the empowering of the Holy Spirit upon us. So that's what we're looking forward to, right? This idea of our Lord going up to heaven and then pouring down His Holy Spirit upon us so that, as you said in this morning's homily, Father Bill, about the, the coward disciples at one point now becoming bold and proclaiming and teaching and speaking about their faith and uh, joyfully doing it without being afraid of of consequences and it's even why that gospel reading regarding today's gospel with Nicodemus is so nuanced and, and multi-layered because it isn't just speaking about um, the you know the nature of baptism and which we can certainly make that point but it does speak to again what we have been talking about what happens when we have an encounter with the risen Christ. And we've talked about, just as we talked about the, the, the road to Emmaus and the Magdalene and, and all the different souls who encountered the risen Christ, they experienced a change in their life. Upon, at that point, there was no going back. And so it is a type of new birth, a type of being reborn into a new reality, into a new spirit that was the result of an encounter with the risen Christ. And we can see that even in the gospel today with Nicodemus. He still, um, he still speaks of the, that clouded reality of, of Jesus. We know that you're a teacher, and, and yet our Lord very lovingly helps him to try to have a more transcendent view of, of who he is and speaking of being born in the Spirit and something that comes from heaven. And he's making Nicodemus think, well, what comes from heaven? Are you speaking about you, that you've come from heaven, that you're not just my brother, the teacher, that you actually um, are going to be more than that, inviting Nicodemus again to come to his own faith and to his own conclusion and not just simply saying, well, Come on, dummy, here, can't you see who I am? He lovingly and, and brilliantly helps him to, to, to think not only rationally, but think spiritually with his heart and thinking about heaven and rebirth, new life, and all that entails, and then looking at the one who is speaking to him and making that connection. All of us are in that same boat. For sure, and as you were saying that, like, I couldn't stop thinking. I was, I was going to ask you guys if, uh, like, your journey about encountering the risen Lord and the Holy Spirit and, and that change in your life, 
But I think we kind of touched that on, uh, on our vocation stories when we talked about going from, from one state into another. And this idea that the encountering of, of the Holy Spirit, the encountering of the risen Lord, is not just a moment, it's not just on a single day, but it is a reoccurring matter that every time we, we pray, every time we put ourselves in silence and we come before the Lord in prayer or in the sacraments, it is that constant encounter with Jesus. That is not a single time, that is not a formula, but that it is a dynamic process in which we are constantly walking with and our Lord being with us. This constant companionship that gives us life, that gives us that courage, that gives us that boldness to endure uh, the difficult times. Yeah. And that's why for, for Catholics it is so important that we understand that Easter is not a one and done. It's not a, okay, here's Easter Sunday, bang, we've celebrated Easter, now let's just go on with whatever we were doing. If we're going to claim to be an Easter people, Easter must be part of a continuum. It must be part of a lengthy and ongoing process of metanoia, of conversion. And that nothing in our faith is a one and done. That everything has a a process of maturation, a process of theosis, a process of becoming more and more like God throughout our entire life, which is why no Easter, no Lent, no Easter from one year to the next should be the same. And should we should never approach it in the same way because our conversion, our process of growing in our relationship with the risen Christ is a process. It's not one minute I am and the next minute I'm not or vice versa. It is a process. What was that? A growing up in the faith. A growing up in the faith. Yeah. And that's a, the, the beauty of our faith that it is like we're always on it. We're always constantly walking in it. And the beauty that it is not meant to be burdensome. The beauty that as we walk with the Lord, as the more we pray, the more we come to Him, the more that we give ourselves to Him, or that we even just open ourselves to the possibility of God, like the joy and the peace that comes with that. It will come with, with struggles, with issues, with difficulties, with pains and sufferings at times, but just knowing that you're not alone in the journey, and that you're not just with your body, but you are with your Lord, with your Creator, with your Savior that is with you, that loves you, that desires to be with you. Uh, that's a great joy of our Christian journey and the great hope that we look forward to seeing our Lord face to face in which I think you touched on the homily today that we're not called to be fearful and engage in our own anxieties in the midst of this crisis that we're in, but that we're called to look forward to our faith, forward to hold fast to our Lord, that He's the one that will give us that courage, that strength, to carry us on through this difficult time, and that the hope of the eternal life, we know that this is just a pilgrim, pil pilgrim er we are pilgrims on the journey, pilgrims on the way. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we look forward to, to heaven. As part of the this, this journey, this walking with our Lord, uh, I know a lot of you have been asking for us to discuss on, on, on indulgences and what is that, what is that, what does that mean, how is that applied to our faith. And especially as yesterday we were talking about Divine Mercy Sunday and there's that uh, either a plenary indulgence or a, a full and partial, a partial in, in, indulgence with it. Um, we thought it would be Good to talk about it, discuss it, with the claimer that this is not meant to be a full teaching of it. There's a lot that goes into it that in 10, 15 minutes we can't really cover it all completely fully to what the church teaches, but a discussion that allows us to have a better understanding of what it is and how to apply it. Yeah. Indulgences, unfortunately, in the church have become um, a very misunderstood topic a very misused topic and it has also been used as a weapon against us going as far back as the as the the um, the so-called reformation in the in the middle ages uh, when the question then becomes are the is the concept of an indulgence evil or is it the way that it was used at the time 
um, evil. And indulgences themselves, like everything in the church, is a mercy, is a goodness and a mercy. Anytime, anytime we start to get vinegar in our mouth, or we start listening to um, those whispering voices that are outside the church, um, either well-meaning or not so well-meaning, and all of a sudden um, causing us to want to say that, that there is something about our church that is either enslaving or not merciful or vengeful or whatever it is, it is important that we cast that aside. As we've talked about any number of times, Holy Scripture is always for our good and never for our ill. And our holy, enduring, persevering Catholic Church, the Bride of Christ, is in itself formed as a perfect institution. Never always perfect in its application, nor perfect in the stewards given um, access to her, but the church herself is perfect and all good as only the Bride of Christ could be, and everything that the church proposes is always for our good and never for our ill. It is senseless, it is beyond senseless to imagine that the church would propose something that was for our ill and not for our good, and indulgences are that. And I think it would be good first to understand what the word means, and I think Father has uh, was helpful with that, with regard to the, the Latin word. The Latin. Yeah, the Latin word is indulgentia, indulgentia, and and it has a a, a beautiful connotation. Um, do you want to share that? Father? To be uh, the Catholic Encyclopedia says it's to be kind or tender. Originally meant the kindness or favor. And then in post-classic Latin, it came to mean a remission of a tax or a debt. In Roman law, the Vulgate the old, and the old, of the Old Testament, it was used to express release from captivity of, or punishment. In theological language, also the word is sometimes employed in the primary sense to signify the kindness and the mercy of God. And that certainly connects back with our, our that we just came off of this past Sunday on the Divine Mercy Sunday. But in a special sense, in which it is considered an indulgence is a remission of the temporal punishment due to sin, the guilt which has been forgiven, among the equivalent terms used, uh, and it goes on from there. The, the beauty of it, uh, like in Spanish, uh, well, then what's the Latin word again? Indulgencia. Indulgencia. And then in Spanish is indulgencia. But indul is like, it's like sweetness. sweetness. Like, it's like a candy, almost. Yeah. Dulce. Dulce, yeah. yeah. I mean, I got a sweet tooth. You can probably tell by my shape. <laughs> but it's such a beautiful idea that our Lord gives us His, like, His mercy and His sweetness for the re remission of our sins. That indulgences always are connected with the sacrament of penance yeah. and with the forgiveness of sins. But what we fail to understand is that sin is, is, comes in two parts. And let's liken it to something that's very practical. Imagine a broken window. So imagine that, that you're out throwing a baseball, and the baseball gets away from you, and it goes through the window and breaks the window. There are two things involved in that. First is going to the owner of the window and asking for forgiveness for breaking the window. And the owner says, absolutely, I forgive you. You're forgiven for breaking my window. But there's still something left, and what's left is I need to do something in order to pay for that window, either monetarily or in, uh, in a work of mercy or in something to, to say to the owner that I, I take full responsibility for, for the breaking of that window. So there is the guilt aspect or the, what we would call the eternal aspect of committing a sin and then there's the temporal or the real uh, uh, aspect of committing sin. And, and one is forgiveness from our Lord and remission of, the, of any eternal consequence, any eternal guilt. But there is still a temporal or a, um, a residual uh, responsibility that we have. And the 
the accumulated residual of the temporal aspects of our sin have to be remitted some way because nothing imperfect, nothing with any residual stain can be admitted to heaven because only, only the fully purified, the, that which is, is thoroughly cleansed can, can enter through the gates of heaven. And therefore we get to the mercy of purgatory, which is another thing that we can talk about because thoroughly misunderstood, one of the greatest mercies of the church. And, and so in like fashion, the indulgence has nothing to do with the eternal consequence of sin, which is the forgiveness of God for the eternal consequence for the guilt of our sin. But it simply makes an understanding that there needs to be a restitution for the temporal, earthly aspects of the sin that we commit. And to be given a sweetness, an indulgence, a mercy for that, by definition, should be a cleansing effect that would make us um, more ready to, um, to approach the gates of heaven and, and reduce uh, the amount of, of stain that we, that we bring uh, to, uh, uh, at the time of our death. So go back to that. Where exactly does the sacrament fit in there? The sacrament of reconciliation forgives the break of the relationship that we cause by our sin with the divine, with, with the Trinity, particularly with our Father in Heaven. And, and when we receive reconciliation, when we receive forgiveness in the sacrament, we are forgiven in total for the eternal consequence of our sin. And that eternal consequence is the difference between uh, forever separation from our Lord, which by definition is hell, and, and remaining um, in communion, remaining in friendship with our Lord. He never breaks the friendship with us, but we break it with our sin. And by, by asking for forgiveness of the eternal consequence, then that eternal consequence is forgiven. And there's where grave or mortal sin must be taken, is to the, is to the sacrament of reconciliation, to relieve the eternal consequence. So why the indulgence then? If I've been forgiven, why the indulgence? Because there remains the, the fact that the broken window must be paid for. Even though you have received forgiveness of the owner, the broken window still there's still a residual responsibility there, and there's where the indulgences have their, have their mercy, is that, is that through um, the indulgence, which is usually a type of restitution that we pray, that we pay for, for the stain of sin. And to suggest somehow that, that, that we have no responsibility is, is as if to go to go back to some of the, um, the, we'll call them unnamed individuals who in times past have said that just presume on God's mercy and sin and sin boldly because, because then, um, you know, God will forgive you no matter what, God will forgive you. Well, who in the world, I being one, to me it, it, is, it breaks my heart that we would even presume on God's mercy. Yes, His mercy is there. Yes, His mercy is all-encompassing. But for us as creatures to presume it and just say, I can do whatever the H I want and, and presume on His mercy with no, um, you know, with, no, uh, with no sense of any culpability or responsibility, um, that's heartbreaking. Heartbreaking, especially given the beauty of the mercy of, that we have the mercy of, of our God. So the question that comes a lot of times is, how many indulgences do I have to do to get to heaven? It is, it's a question that probably doesn't even need to be asked, only because we do not know the full consequence of our sin until the moment that we die. We do not know. Just like we cannot make any determination about, well, that soul is in heaven and that soul is in hell, because that then sets us up as the judge, and the only just judge is, is our Lord. We have no ability to judge, nor do we, nor can we see 
the full, the full impact of our sin. We just can't see it. I suspect we will see it. I suspect that, that if, there's any, um, if there's any part of the purgation process, it is however long it takes, that reliving, that, that spooling up of, and a reliving of, of our sin and, and begging at that point for, uh, for any forgiveness for anything that's residual or um, that is left over. Because re remember, our sin is not harmless. Our sin is, uh, you know, is part of the weight of the cross that our Lord, that our Lord bears. And this idea somehow that that um, that we uh, have should not be mindful of the weight and nature of our sin, I think, is a is a sad commentary, and that we as Catholics uh, should really shun that. Not that we should walk around with this black cloud and we're just the guiltiest people ever to walk the earth. That's not it. But we still must have a sense of responsibility, and I think that's where indulgences really are truly a mercy. Because it prohibits us, it, at least it should prohibit us, from, uh, from presuming on our Lord, which I think is, is, is um, a sin in and of itself. And the beauty of our faith that our Lord continues to like, reach down to us, like through these different opportunities that He gives us to be able to receive the sweetness of His mercy. And... Like that the church is able to do this and to offer this kind of forgiveness because of the authority and the power given to the church by Jesus himself, right? That authority to, uh, to bind sins or to lose sins and to forgive sins that we heard just on Sunday. That the divine mercy of our Lord was tied to the forgiveness of sins that our Lord gave that authority to his apostles for them to go out and forgive or retain sin. So... This idea of the, the indulgences is not magic. It's not, um, it's not, uh, uh, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, it, it, it's not just like a, a thing, like a crotch to get you through it. It's not meant to. And beware, beware, beware. Those who would say, you Catholics, you Catholics, you believe that you have to work for your salvation. That's not it. We know that our salvation is based on our faith in the one who saves us, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But we will not, as Catholics, presume. We will not presume. We will stay cognizant and mindful of the fact that we are sinful so that we will do everything in our power not to sin. Because otherwise, how are we going to be on the journey of, of theosis, the journey of, of putting on Christ, of becoming more and more like Christ, unless we jettison our sins. And yet if we walk around in a state of presumption and just say, you know, the, I just am a walking pile of manure and, and, and I'm just going to presume that God will save me regardless, is tragic, I think. Uh, and it's not what I think. I, it is tragic. And instead, we have the opportunity to be purged of our sin. The eternal consequences through the beautiful sacrament of reconciliation and the material consequences, the, ter the, the temporal consequences, either through, through the process of purgation or being able to be relieved of that to some degree through um, good and holy acts of, of indulgence, which again is not trying to work out our salvation as much as it is saying, I am responsible for my sinfulness and I do not wish to continue in my sin. For sure. So the goal is not to work or to go after indulgences. No. Like the goal, uh, the end goal should never be an indulgence because then it becomes a matter of insurance, right? You're just buying an insurance for heaven. That's not the point at all. Like the point of indulgences are channels through which you it, they will direct you closer to Jesus Himself. This Jesus who is sweet, this Je sweet in His mercy, right? Not just like the the nice sweet pal, uh, but like His sweetness and His love and His mercy and His desire to come to us and to offer His heart. Like yesterday, we heard about Him offering His side. Hey, 
come and see, look. And so these indulgences are ways in which we are drawn deeper into a relationship with our Lord who loves us, who desires us, who wants to share His sweetness, His kindness, His favor with us. And the beauty of our sacraments is, is that for us who go and anoint as priests, um, when someone is about to, to pass or, or, or to die, and we go and anoint, and there is always a possibility, uh, a permit, uh, it's not permission, it's, it's, we're given the opportunity to offer uh, an apostolic pardon to the souls that are uh, about to, to die. And that apostolic pardon, it's a, it's a plenary indulgence that we offer through the authority of the church for the salvation of the soul that we're about to, or that we're anointing. And it speaks to the power of the sacraments, that the sacraments that the church offers are not just simply for tradition's sake or to receive your oils, but that all of that points to the salvation of our souls, which uh, St. Peter yesterday in the second reading talked about that the, uh, the goal of faith is salvation. And everything we do as a church is for the salvation of souls. And, sorry. No, go ahead. And, and many will say that, well, think back, and it was because of indulgences that the whole Protestant um, Revolution, Reformation took place. Think again. It was not the problem of the nature of the indulgence. It was the problem of how they were being used. You have to go back and read your history and realize that at the time they were building the Basilica, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And a very unscrupulous individual thought that it would be a way to raise funds, wrongly now, of course, to raise funds in order to um, have more money available to build the basilica. And he had this harebrained idea that he could sell indulgences. Sell indulgences. Is that a problem that the indulgence itself is wrong? Or that, that a sinful human, a sinful man in the church, misused the indulgence and opened a can of worms that that now we can't put back in, back in the bottle. I would say it's the latter and not the former. And so we must understand why the church has maintained indulgences, because like so much of the church, it is a mercy and a way that our Lord can, can manifest his love and his divine mercy for us, and that we can enter into that in a particular way. If we don't know our history, if we don't understand, we're likely to just, just get blown away by somebody who wants to convict us in a way that clearly they don't understand either. Yeah. So you're welcome to make a donation or, or something to pay for the broken window or something like that. It, it's not a sign. I can't say for this indulgence you do this prayer, this, and you donate this amount of money to this cause. Um, but it invites you into the sweetness and the kindness of the Lord. And it's in dwelling in there that we respond in generosity of love and, and response to God and to our fellow men and women. For sure. Just as we draw to a close, because we're over our time, Emily was asking, what's the difference between indulgence and penance? Um, and really, they're not meant to be opposite. They go hand in hand. That in order for one to receive an indulgence and one for, to receive the sweetness of Jesus, one has to have that, that penance, that contrition for our sins, right? Well, remember, the indulgence comes this way toward us, and our penance comes this way in, in restitution. We do penance in, in sadness for our sin. The indulgence is a grace that is given, given to us. They're, they come from, from completely different directions. The indulgence comes from a divine origin, penance, is generated from sadness in our heart for our sin. And they do meet each other, but they're not of the same origin. Absolutely. So, well, that was a huge topic. There's a lot of uh, uh, questions. It's, it's a, a deep, beautiful source of hope, of grace that our, our, our Lord through the church gives us to encounter our poverty. And again, all uh, is for the efforts of our salvation, for the sweetness of Jesus, 
coming down to us, to be with us, to rescue us, to give us that opportunity to encounter Him in the power of the Spirit. So, equally important that we don't treat these complex topics superficially because that's the way they, they become improperly um, spoken about, discussed, manifest. Before we discuss these topics, we pray that all of us, clergy, laity alike, will be fully steeped in history, catechesis, canon law, all of those sorts of things, so that we speak from, from a source of, of knowledge and authority rather than just a superficial knee-jerk response or responding to the ignorance of others, which, which leads nowhere. For sure. So in that note, let us uh, take a moment of silence and bring, put ourselves before our Lord. And let us imagine our Lord coming down to us with His pure side, offering that sweetness of His mercy and of His love. And in prayer, let us run to that encounter. Let us ask Him to overwhelm our hearts, our brokenness, to move us, to shake us to the core of our being so that we may be open and humble enough to come and run to that sweetness, to that divine mercy of His, that He may empower us to always be in communion with Him, to always be in that relationship with Him, that He may empower us to go out of ourselves, to bring that love and that sweetness and that mercy to the people that are around us, that He may flow from His heart into ours, and from ours to our neighbor. Let us ask a Blessed Mother to be with us on this journey that she may always, through her powerful inter intercession, may lead us closer to the heart of Jesus as we pray. Hail Mary, full, full of grace, grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed, blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Alleluia. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia. Alleluia.